Okay, good afternoon. I'm going to introduce, uh, I'm going to introduce Dr. Gaines, Dr. Brian Gaines. And so when I first came in here, they gave me the bow of everybody and I talked to him or whatever to try to find something interesting to say about him. And he said, I think the most interesting thing about me is that I'm a military brat and so his dad is in the Canadian Air Force, so he moved around a lot. And so I think that kind of plays into what happens today. So since we had to flip this around, so he's used to going with the flow, so we can appreciate that. Um, he's a professor at the University of Illinois in Champaign. And he's a graduate of Stanford University, and he's done a lot of work dealing with election laws, doing statistics, and uh, I guess getting an opinion of how voters think and what, where they're going to move, how they're moving uh, as far as their thinking and where they're going politically. Other thing that's good, he's in, in Illinois, he's on television a lot, he's one of these pundits or whatever that's on television a lot. And the last thing they said that's very interesting about him is that he's run seven marathons on, 17, uh, on the seven, on the seven uh, continents. And so without further ado, we're gonna bring up Dr. Gaines, thank you. All right, so I'm going to spare you from looking at me the whole while. I have some slides, and uh, it's somewhat fortuitous that I'm going now. I'm going to pick up on the very last theme that Professor Wayne had. He mentioned, maybe a second last theme, he mentioned that uh, so far President Obama has pretty high approval. Uh, I have to apologize. If you looked at the program, it said I'm going to speak about the presidency, Congress, and the bureaucracy. If there are any real bureaucracy junkies here, I'm not really going to talk about the bureaucracy. So I'm, I apologize for the bait and switch. But I am going to talk about presidential approval and congressional approval. What do I mean by approval? I mean the same thing Professor Wayne did. I mean job approval. So pollsters have of late been asking random samples of Americans about the president. Do you approve or disapprove of the job? Now it's Barack Obama. Before it was George W. Bush. Before that it was Bill Clinton. They ask this, do you approve the way the person's handling the job, the president? Uh, lots of variation in the questions. I'm going to show you a lot of figures that have a lot of little dots on them. Every one of those is a poll. There's a little bit of variation in, the, in what question they ask, but basically it's the same question. If this were an academic panel, I'd spend a lot of time talking about the minutia like that, but take my word for it. It's all approval. What I'm not going to be talking about is favorability. So the other question pollsters like to ask uh, the general public is, well, do you have a favorable opinion of this person? With uh, Bill Clinton, at the end of the presidency, there was an extremely interesting divergence. People said they liked the job he was doing. They weren't so sure they had a favorable opinion. They didn't trust him. They wouldn't want him alone with their daughter in an elevator, that sort of thing. Um, to continue picking on the poor guy. But uh, this is all about job approval. So I'll talk about the president, I'll talk a little about the Congress, and I'll try to talk about why there might be differences. And I don't know if any of the members of Congress, other than the, the, our host Lou Fry, any of the former members or current members are here, but give away one of the punchlines, people approve of the Congress a lot less than the president. So uh, maybe that shits as well, they don't have to hear me saying that. All right, so so far, the Obama uh, level of approval, it's about normal. This is showing you from Eisenhower onward, what is in the first seven months, what we, you, characterizes the honeymoon period. What has the approval been like? I've got red bars for the Republicans and blue for the Democrats. And I drew two lines over these to show what the averages are. And the first three here, Eisenhower, uh, J John F. Kennedy, and Lyndon Johnson, in their first period in office, they had something over 70% approval, pretty good. Almost uh, you know, seven in 10 Americans, more than seven in 10, said they thought they were doing a good job. Since uh, Richard Nixon's time, it's been lower. It's been a little bit under 60. And uh, exactly as Professor Wayne said, Bar Barack Obama so far is about, uh, on average, a little bit better than George Bush, quite a bit better than Clinton, who came in much lower than most. Uh, Gerald Ford is an accident, accidental president uh, taking over in the middle of the term after a disgraced pre predecessor resigned. He had very low approval, but there's not a lot of difference here between um, Nixon and uh, Carter and Reagan and the first George Bush, the second George Bush and Obama. So, so far, if you're asking how's Obama doing, you'd say, not bad, about right. Of course, uh, if you're doing the arithmetic now, thinking seven months in, we're not that far in, are we? We're nowhere near that far in. So it's preliminary for him. We'll wait and see four months from now how his, his honeymoon period. There's nothing magical about seven months. It just happens to be what people think is about typical for this period where the new president, these are only for the first term. I don't have second terms on here for Clinton or Reagan or Bush. But in the first term, how do they do? The, the, the stylized fact is uh, they get pretty high approval ratings for a little while. Obama's kind of t typical where he should be. Here's the, the Bush figure. Now I've got a lot more data for you to look at. Each of these dots is a poll, and this is not the whole of, of the George W. Bush presidency. It's the uh, up through re-election, a little bit, one month extra. And I, I've titled this Strange President or Strange Precedent. You can choose which you prefer as a title. Uh, it's a very strange precedent as approval goes. So the very first little sliver here, if you look at that first part, that's a typical honeymoon. First six, seven months, 
He's got uh, a little bit lower than 60% approval. There's do the dots are some of them are higher, some are lower. Some of that's sampling error. Some of that's that you, know, you always get weird rogue polls. The questions differ. But basically, it's flat. He's got flat approval. He's got rising disapproval. How is that possible? What's going on? Well, some people, when you ask them, do you approve of the job the president's doing, say, I don't know. I uh, haven't thought about it. I'm not sure who the president is yet. Uh, I can't make up my mind. There's some things I like, some I don't like. What tends to happen in this honeymoon period is that the don't know is melt away. So after about seven months, hardly anybody says they don't know anymore. Moreover, what they, the don't know people tend to do is they start saying, you know, I, I'm not that happy with it. I don't approve. So disapproval tends to rise. Approval tends to be flat. This is George W. Bush's pattern. It's pretty typical of those other presidents. And I showed you a whole bunch more figures like this. What's very atypical, very, very unusual, and made the George W. Bush's presidency a boon for people that like to study this kind of public opinion data, was after September 11th, this huge, huge surge of approval. The jargon we use in academics is a rally, a public opinion rally. He got the highest ever uh, levels of support we've seen. His father had very, very high levels during the first Gulf War. These were even higher. Upwards of 90% of the people saying, I approve of the job the president's doing. You see these little, he starts to slide downwards, looks a little bit like a roller coaster here. Slides down, jumps up again. This is the beginning of the uh, Iraq War. Slides down, Saddam Hussein is captured, it jumps, it jumps another. Each of these rallies follows some kind of a, a discrete event, a crisis of some kind, or a major world event. And then the major pattern with George W. Bush was hit a high, fell down, hit a high, fell down, gradually fell. The other thing that's interesting about this, this is basically his first term. I'm not showing you the, the end of the second term when he had very, very low approval. But he peaked up again just about the right time to get reelected. If he, if he was controlling this figure, his timing was pretty good. He got back to his pretty close to his initial honeymoon first six, seven months, right around the time he had to get reelected in November 2004. Dips down by the end of this figure. If I'd drawn this out through the last uh, up to 2008, fell quite dramatically in the second term. Um, so th this isn't what most of them look like. The first part, the honeymoon, almost all these presidents have had that. This giant rally is very atypical. It's not an unusual kind of thing. There have been rallies for most presidents at times of crisis, but this was huge. Um, so what should we think we should expect to see with, with Barack Obama, President Obama? We certainly hope we don't have a, a major, major international crisis on the par of, of September 11th that would precipitate a rally. Um, but it makes the comparisons quite hard because basically the, George, the first term of George W. Bush's presidency was defined by this huge rally. The other thing that defined it was very, very high polarization. So that was the whole American public. Each of those surveys was 1,500 people, 1,000 people, 600 people, different pollsters, different numbers, asking, what do you think? And I gave you the proportion of that whole group that approved or disapproved. Now I'm breaking them down according to whether they say they're Republicans, Democrats, or Independents. If you look at those Republicans, they always liked George Bush. They didn't have to rally very much after September 11th. They were giving him on the order of 90% approval to begin with. Over time, some of them fall off, and, and by the end of this series, he's got maybe 70% approval from a little higher than 70. But the Republicans are, are basically pretty supportive all the while. The independents and the Democrats both spiked upwards, and I, I drew smooth curves over these. If you, if you can see those dots, you probably can't from most places in this room. Right after September 11th, even the Democrats, overwhelmingly, big, big proportions said, we approve of the job the president's doing, we're with him. But they didn't stay with him for very long. Uh, Democrats, by the end of the first term here, actually this is, this is drawn out through 2006, it's a little further, um, they're down to 10% approval. They're really fed up with George W. Bush. The independents, the story of, of the Bush presidency in part is the independents end up looking more like the Democrats than like the Republicans. So these aren't people who have donkeys tattooed to their chest. They're, they didn't always dislike Bush. Some of them voted for him, quite a few did. But over time, they ended up feeling like the Democrats so that he wasn't getting very high approval ratings from them. A lot of them just didn't, you know, this is a pretty bare bones question, but if you asked them, do you like the job he's doing, they said no. This kind of polarization is not terribly unusual, but the extent of polarization is unusual. If you looked at, if I had data here for Clinton and Reagan and previous presidencies, first of all, I'd have a far, far fewer data points because not as many pollsters were asking this. It used to be Gallup would do this pretty regularly. Every now and then somebody else would put it in an academic study, but we didn't have mounds and mounds of data. During the Clinton impeachment, suddenly everybody who had a poll started asking about presidential approval. And it, uh, the amount of data skyrocketed. And you, you can see here I have a, a gargantuan number of data points. Uh, and that's continued now. So we have huge, huge numbers of polls. Everybody and his brothers asking everybody they can reach on a telephone or by internet, do you approve of the president? But th this extent of polarization, the Republicans and Democrats being very, very different, that's, that's sort of a, a signature of the Bush presidency. Is that going to carry on into the Obama presidency? 
That's one of the sort of lingering questions. I think so. This is a little bit of a digression. I, I don't want to dwell on these figures too much. This is a non-approval question. So this is a, how much of the time can you trust federal government in Washington to do what's right? I'll show you the state government. All I want to do here is emphasize that there, the, a lot of people see the world through partisan lenses. So this is uh, the federal government at the time when the Republicans control the House and the Senate. There's a Republican president. And I've, the, the bars here are people who are strong Democrats, Democrats, independents who lean to the Democratic Party, pure independents. They're not reaps. They're not Dems. They really are truly independent. Independents that lean to the Republicans, Republicans, and strong Republicans. So as I move right, I get more and more Republican, less Democratic. And not surprisingly, they say they trust the, the federal government, which is at this point, this is 2006, made up of Republicans. They trust them to do what's right most of the time. Uh, and not that many of them say they never trust them. You look at the Democrats off on the left, a lot of them say they never trust the federal government to do what's right. Not so many of them say they trust it to do what's right all the time. This is my idea of what it looks like when people look, th look at the world through partisan lenses. I don't think that it's the federal government structure, it's our constitutional structure they're reacting to. It's, well, who is the federal government? Is it my party or is it the other party? This is a survey I did in Illinois. So Illinois at the time had a Democratic governor. He was since arrested and impeached. So he's uh, achieved some notoriety of the kind you don't like to if you're a politician. Rod Blagojevich and the Democrats controlled both chambers. And here I just have the mirror image. Here's the Republicans. The purple bar means, yeah, I trust the government to do what's right. Republicans trust the federal government. The Democrats trusted the state government. Uh, and, and the Republicans were saying, I never trust the people in Springfield. They're all Democrats. So this is people looking at the world through partisan lenses. We see that with presidential approval. We see that with congressional approval. One of my stories is going to be, um, what's the difference between the president and Congress? Here's one more item. This is not an approval item, but it's a, uh, how much corruption do you think characterizes uh, the, the, the federal Congress, President Bush? I had some more questions about state government, Mayor Daley, the city of Chicago. What's interesting to me here is I see the same kind of partisan effect, the Democrats, say both the, 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 and this is 2006, so the Republicans control the House and the Senate, and they say, yeah, they're pretty corrupt. They're down toward, the low end here is highly corrupt, and the, the high end of the scale is not at all corrupt. They think that both the President and the Congress are corrupt. As you move right, you get to the independents and then to the Republicans. Their opinion of the Congress improves a little, but frankly, it's not that great. Even by the strong Republicans are saying this Congress controlled by my party, it's about middle on a corruption schedule, not so great. George Bush, the president, gets very good ratings from all the people who call themselves Republicans. The strong Republicans, the, the people who say, yeah, I'm a Republican, I'm not a strong one, but I am a Republican. And the people who say, well, I'm an independent, but if, if you push me, which do I lean to? I guess I lean to the Reaps. All three of them give President Bush very good ratings on the corruption scale, much better than Congress. Uh, so I, ga I gave this the title, Stand By Your President. I think we'll see this in the approval numbers later, and I expect they'll see this through the, the Obama presidency. Presidents command a lot more loyalty uh, in, on, in terms of job approval, in terms of trust, in terms of perceptions of corrupt, corruption than legislatures in the Congress in particular. So here's some numbers on Obama. I'm supposed to be talking not about Bush, but Obama. So we've sort of seen the historical baseline. This is uh, just the Gallup series. I'll show you three figures in a row that are the same thing, just different polling firms. Uh, red lines approval now, blue lines disapproval, the greens are the don't knows. This looks kind of like that Bush figure. It's just the first piece of the Bush figure. We're not seven months in yet. We're only three months in. In fact, if you're counting carefully, we haven't actually had the 100th day yet. Uh, this morning, um, the representative mentioned she's in her 100th day, but the president comes in after the Congress, so we're, we're just approaching the 100th day. But so far, pretty high approval. Maybe drops off a little bit, according to Gallup, but, but Obama's above 60. The disapproval's rising. It's rising from almost nothing. Right after inauguration, hardly anyone says they disapprove of the job he's doing. He hadn't had much time to do much. Um, it, rises and it, it rises at the expense of the don't knows. People stop saying they don't know. Those people mainly start saying, there's something he's doing I don't like. This is the Gallup series. If I said, I'm not sure I believe Gallup, let's, let's ask Rasmussen, another pollster that does uh, lots and lots of polls, daily tracking. It looks very similar. It's a little lower. Rasmussen's got uh, a slight, about a five point lower uh, lo measurement of the level of approval of the president, but same kind of pattern, disapproval rising. They ask the question in such a way that they discourage don't know, so not many people ever said they don't know. One more figure, this is everybody except Gallup and Rasmussen. Uh, all the polls I could find average together. It's noisier, there's more different questions here. There's the, the, some of these people are asking adults, some are asking likely voters, some are asking registered voters. A lot more noise of that kind, but basically we still see the, the usual, the pattern that everybody associates with presidential honeymoons. Flat approval, pretty high, above 60 if you take the average. Disapprovals climbing up. Uh, it's still quite low. It's more than two to one, the ratio of people who say they like what President Obama is doing to those who say they don't approve, but it's climbing. 
They don't know is falling off. Not so many people say they don't know anymore. You know, these surveys, you ask 1,500 people, you'll find a few people who say, oh, I never heard of Barack Obama. Who are we talking about? So you, know, you can always get a, a, some noise in any survey, but over time, the, those don't knows, you know, the people who don't have a firm, a firm opinion, they, uh, they disappear and everybody has an idea what they think. How about the polarization? I said what was most marked about George Bush in some respects was this Republicans and Democrats saw a completely different president. The Democrats really, by uh, after that, that big September 11th rally, very strongly disapproved. The Republicans liked what they saw. We see some of that. Uh, this is, a, I don't have a, a, a time series line for you to look at now because we, we don't have enough polls yet where I've got the partisan breakdown, but uh, I think these are kind of comparable to the numbers that Professor Wayne mentioned. Um, Republicans got 37% approval. That's better than Democrats uh, were giving George Bush by the end, but it's not so different from how uh, Democrats saw George Bush at this stage of his presidency. The independents, 60% of them like Barack Obama. They're not quite as warm as, as uh, the Democrats. The Democrats basically, only 3% say they don't know. Uh, they, 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 they disapprove. Sorry. The 10% who say they don't know, probably some of those are people who are disappointed uh, for different reasons from the Republicans. They're critics of, from the left who think, why the heck hasn't he gotten more troops out of Iraq yet? That's why I liked him in the first place. They have some complaints, but mostly they're holding their fire. They're saying, I don't know. Only 3% say they don't like him. And the, and the independents, again, 60% is a pretty good number. They look a bit more like the, the Democrats than the Republicans in their evaluations of, of whether or not they approve of what President Obama has done thus far. Um, so polarization is still there. It's, it's maybe not quite as dramatic as we saw at the end of the Bush presidency, but maybe it's on its way up. Oh. So all right, so that's just descriptive. That's, that's what I pick up the phone and call random Americans and get them to talk to you. If you can pull that off, it's harder and harder to get people to answer the phone. They've got call, uh, caller ID and they know it's a pollster. So we use internet and we try anything we can to reach them and, and this is what they say. But what do we know about why people approve or don't approve? Um, three big sort of staples or, or uh, uh, legs to this stool in this whole literature. Sorry. Um, one of them is crises. I mentioned the September 11th crisis, a uh, big, big rally. When there's a major world event, especially something bad, uh, approval for the president rises. And, we, and it even rises for Congress, although that one melts away much faster. I drew a little pirate's flag here because we've had a couple of crises lately that might actually help the Obama numbers rise a little bit. Um, they haven't been anywhere near as dramatic and, and, and they're relatively small scale events, but a few more pirates seizing major uh, tankers and taking hostages probably would, would cause a little bump up. Uh, some of the people who say they don't know or they don't like him will say, well, I'm with my president in this time of crisis. The honeymoons, uh, what's causing that honeymoon anyway? Why, why would there be a period where right at the beginning of a presidency, the president's getting these nice evaluations from the public. Um, there's at least two ingredients in this, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about each. Um, part of it seems to be better press, better media tone. The uh, newsprint, the news media, the print media, and television and radio, um, increasingly the internet. In all cases, the, if you sort of take all the coverage you can of the president and try to characterize is it good, is it bad, is it neutral, it, gets, it starts out pretty good, it gets worse as the presidency proceeds, but there's a period of the honeymoon seems to coincide with pretty good media. Uh, I think Barack Obama had exceptionally good media during the campaign. Both the Clinton and McCain campaigns would tell you they're pulling their hair out over how good his press was. Why, couldn't the, why was the media just so much on the other side? And, and some journalists after the fact have even said maybe they were a little bit too smitten and, and too fawning in their praise. But um, I think the honeymoons tend to, to, to be characterized by pretty good press. I'll show you nothing very systematic, but a little random sample. And the other th part, half of that then is, well, maybe it's not the journalists. It's just that th there's not so much sniping. R prominent Republicans, prominent commentators on public affairs don't, don't start off a presidency complaining and, and, and uh, making public uh, pronouncements about the president and his faults. And that, that picks up after a few months. So everybody cuts the president slack for a little while and then at some point, all bets are off, the gloves come off, and they start pounding at him. Last one, uh, maybe is sort of the thing that ev on everybody's lips, people talk this morning a lot about the economy. Uh, I've got the word stupid in here in deference to, I guess, Jim Carville or whoever it was who first said it's the economy stupid about how Bill Clinton was going to get reelected and elected in 1992. The three issues were the economy, the economy, and the economy. So maybe presidential approval is just all about is the economy in good shape? My answer to that is no, but let me show you that. So first, the economy. Here's the Bush economy to the Obama economy. What are we looking at? This is uh, the Dow Jones. It's the logarithm of the Dow Jones, but just think of this as the closing value of the Dow Jones Industrial Index. How, how are the stock market's doing? 
Uh, I've got it in red for the end of the Bush presidency, and it looks like there's a little W there. It's like George W. Bush signing off. His presidency's done. Um, so what's going on in the far left of this figure? When this figure begins in August, basically uh, Obama and McCain are tied in the polls. It looks like a nail-biter of an election. And then chaos on Wall Street. Uh, AIG nearly fails. Lehman Brothers fails. Suddenly, investment banks that people thought were massively uh, solid and, and sound were in big trouble. And McCain starts to fall in the polls. And then the Dow collapses. And people see their retirement uh, funds diminish by 40%. And they start to panic. And it looks like this helped Obama and hurt McCain in a big way. Uh, maybe because people thought Obama had better plans. Maybe just because McCain was from the party of the last president. And someone had to take the blame. And it better be the elephants and not the donkeys. But that's the red. Uh, you see that big dip uh, through the campaign. Obama starts to pull ahead. He wins a pretty comfortable election. The purple in the middle there is the election's over. Obama's the next president, but we have this period before the tra of transition before the president comes in on January 20th. So the month of December, month of November, December, January. Um, how did the markets like Obama's win? Um, not so much. They, they, didn't, they didn't bounce back quickly. It wasn't. Uh, uh, a fear of a McCain victory that was pulling the, the uh, stock market down. They, they stayed pretty down. And then Obama comes in, and it turns blue, and bang, it falls even further. And now people are really panicking about the retirement money and uh, looking for uh, what the, how to, whether they should be buying gold or putting all their money into Icelandic Krona. What's the future? Icelandic Krona was a bad bet, as it turns out. Uh, it looked good for a while. but um, And then, now this is sort of brought almost up to present. There's the beginning of a bounce back. So maybe the, the stimulus, maybe some of the uh, announced plans for getting toxic assets off the balance sheets for banks, maybe they're working. Uh, a little early to say, if you look at the far left where the Dow was when McCain and Obama were tied, it was at 11,500, something like that. It's just over 8,000 when I made the figure. It's, I don't know where it is today. Someone's probably looking at their BlackBerry right now saying, shoot, sell, sell, sell. But uh, it's way down, but it's on the way up. So. So what do I say about what, how much of this is driving approval? Well, if you remember the approval, it's flat. It's basically flat through this series. So it looks like appro the approval is not responding to the economy. Well, maybe that's because it's the honeymoon period. So it's a, it's a special period. People give the, the, pres the new president the benefit of the doubt. It's only later that the economy takes over. Well, um, oh, that's a, I'm one slide ahead of myself. The other question you might have, hold that thought. The other thought you might have is, I don't think the economy should be measured with the stock market. That's only for rich people. What really matters is unemployment. These are tough times. It's unemployment that's going to drive people's perception of the president, not the stocks. Well, it turns out the stock market and the unemployment basically march hand in hand uh, in, since the Clinton presidency began. So I have unemployment and the Dow on here. And when one's rising, the other's falling. If, the, if there's a rise in unemployment, the Dow's uh, going down. If the unemployment's falling, the Dow's going up. Um, they're, they're beautifully correlated. If this was a statistics class, we could spend the next 30 minutes talking about all the ways we could statistically measure the correlation of these series, and they'd be high no matter how we did it. So we won't do that. They're really closely tied. If you don't like the stock markets, just pretend I'm talking about unemployment. So now here's the, the question I raised. But um, is, is, does presidential approval, did that again, does it usually track the state of the economy? Does it track the Dow? And this is going back to George Bush again. Uh, the blue line is his approval. This is just Gallup surveys, so it's a little wigglier than those smooth lines I drew when I grabbed every poll I could find from any pollster. But basically, you see the same thing. Big, big, big spike after September 11th, falls off, spikes up again with the beginning of the war, it falls off, Saddam Hussein's captured, falls. What I want to look at is, look at where the, I have the DJIA, the Dow Jones Industrial Average label. The Dow starts rising, and it rises a lot, dramatically. This is the kind of recovery that people in the Obama White House are crossing their fingers right now, saying, this is what we want to see in the next three months. And, and what happens to Bush's approval? Just it falls and it's flat. It's not responding at all. He's not getting credit for this surge in the stock market. And if you believe the last slide, that's a period with falling unemployment too. So um, it just doesn't look like, even if you think it's the economy stupid is a way to win the election, we learned that in 92, it doesn't look like that's a way for the president to get high approval ratings in public opinion. The presidential approval here looks like it's sort of independent of the state of the economy. It's independent of the Dow. It's independent of unemployment. Whether or not people like the job the president's doing doesn't seem to be driven fundamentally by the state of the economy. So maybe it's not the economy, stupid. Um, so let's talk about the press then. I said part of what happens with honeymoons is you get very good press and it progressively gets worse. My sampling for the of the press for today is just The Economist magazine. Um, it's, a, it's a European magazine. It's probably kind of pro-free market. It's not really a right-wing magazine. It's not National Review. It's not The Nation. 
It's in News Magazine, maybe it's a little bit to the, to the right, but it endorsed Obama. So let's go back to just before the election. This is the issue in which they endorsed Obama, and they said America should take a chance, make Barack Obama the new leader of the, of the next leader of the free world, put him on the cover. It's time, it's completely unambiguous. He was their man, not John McCain. Cut forward to, we have that little lull, the transition period, he's hiring people, Bush is still president. He takes office. Uh, another gratuitous swipe at George Bush. The economists, by the end of his term, was, were no fans. They had a headline, the frat boy ships out, and they said few people will, will mourn the departure of the 43rd president. Meanwhile, George Bush has left a dismal legacy, but Barack Obama can do much to repair the, da the damage. So, beginning of his presidency is looking good. If you're looking for how they react to him, coverage is good. The tone is nice. They have a, a somewhat flattering picture. He's looking serious and uh, maybe a little somber, but you know, nice picture on the cover. He's, he's on the cover a lot in this period. Let's jump forward a month. It's, it's Valentine's Day. The cover's not really a Valentine for Obama. Now we've got a cartoon spoofing him crossing the Delaware with this gigantic bag of money. And this, to the rescue, the subheadline is the trouble with the Obama plan. So uh, it's, we're in the honeymoon period still, but the press is getting a little worse, at least if you treat the, the Economist as our sample of the press. And this is a direct quote. This week's marked a huge wasted opportunity in the economic crisis. Mr. Obama's team must recognize this plan or they, like their predecessors, will come to be seen as part of the problem, not the solution. So now he's getting lumped in, in with that frat boy they were so glad to see leaving the office. He could be like his predecessors. Not, not sharp and trenchant criticism, but it's looking more critical. They weren't happy with the plans coming out of the White House and they let him know it. One more month. It's now the Ides of March. Uh, but um, if you just grab that Economist, read the coverage of Obama, it's, it's kind of mixed. It's not so bad. They say America's president's made a good start in foreign policy. But the hard choices are still to come. He hasn't done much yet. Not complaining about his foreign policy, but he hasn't really made big decisions. The cover for a change isn't him. It's the uh, dismal state of the economy. Uh, one more. This is the, the most recent issue. One month ahead again now to the middle of April. I don't have the cover for you, but this is the picture that accompanies the main story that's about the American presidents in this issue. Two cheers and a jeer. So they're still kind of positive, but they're jeering as they're cheering. Um, and this is not an editorial, it's not The Economist saying we don't like his policy, it's saying lots of Americans are unhappy with the trip to Europe. He didn't get much, he asked for more NATO troops in Afghanistan, he didn't get them. Maybe, he's, maybe all this big change from the George Bush presidency, which frankly The Economist was all for, they were very unhappy with Bush. They're already voicing some, some doubt that maybe it's not working so well, that Obama's not really going to be the master of Europe, he's not going to get the whole world on, this side, on his side and get them doing things we want. Again, a somewhat flattering picture. They have Michelle Obama not in a strapless dress that shows off her incredibly well-toned arms, which have got so much coverage. But, you know, it's, it's, it's not great. And as you, as you read on, and my prediction is the next couple of months, we'll see more and more stories in places like The Economist that, that are drawing serious complaints about Obama. The Economist isn't the only source of, of, of uh, media criticism. So I went to CNN and I grabbed a comedian. We're going to hear a, a professional comedian tonight. Uh, we may have a professional comedian as the senator from Minnesota soon. We're waiting to see on that one. So this is Penn Jillette, the, the bigger half of Penn and Teller, the magician comedians. Um, and it's a commentary he wrote on, on uh, CNN. It was on April Fool's Day, but it wasn't an April Fool's joke. And it, there's too much text there for you to read, but the, the gist of the story, the, the title was, Is Obama Skidding or Crashing? The gist of it was, counterintuitively, if you're skidding on snow, I guess that doesn't happen so much down here in Florida, but he learned this, in, I think, in Michigan. Skidding on snow, if you turn into the skid, you get regain control of the car. It's not your instinct, but if you learn to do it driving in a parking lot, you discover that that's the right way to control a car that's sliding around in snow and ice. And so then he comes to say, Obama came to office with very big fiscal problems, big budget deficit, big debt, and he's spending a boatload of money. Now, maybe this is like turning into a skid. Counterintuitively, it's the right thing to do. But maybe it's like accelerating as you drive towards a, a concrete wall, and there's nothing counterintuitive to what happens if you accelerate as you drive towards a wall. It's much worse than braking. The collision's much worse. So what's, why am I pulling off Penn Jillette? Well, he's not a, this isn't Rush Limbaugh. This is not a Republican elected official. This isn't this is someone who almost certainly voted for Obama. He may well have campaigned for him. He starts the article saying he's so damn smart. He's just drip smart. He clearly understands stuff that we could never understand. He's trustworthy. And yet by the end of the article, he's saying, I don't like what Obama's doing with his economic policy. And I think you, it's just natural that the presidential honeymoon sees more and more criticism from the left, from the center, from the right. And that's part of why the approval numbers start to drop. All right, so I've talked about the president. I'm almost out of time. So let me say a few things about Congress and then take some leave time for questions. Um, how, does, how do people react when, they, when they pollsters ask them the same kind of questions, say, do you approve of the job that Congress is doing? 
they almost always liked them less than the president. So I went back to, to Clinton and Bush here. The red line is Congress. The Clinton and Bush lines is a break there in the period where Bush took over from Clinton. And Clinton's well ahead of Congress. People like him more than the Congress. That's a Republican Congress, a Democratic president. Maybe the, the difference has to do with the people's affect for the parties. There are more Democrats in these polls. But then we get a Republican president and Republican Congress. And uh, the president's still doing better. Bush is doing better than Congress. And then we get this tremendous spike in approval after the September 11th attacks. And the Congress gets a big spike, too. People say, we're with the Congress right now. But that melts away fast. Pretty quickly, they're down. Congress has, has fallen by 20 points, and they're down to 60% approval. It's still a great level for Congress. But they don't hold that, that kind of support. Bush's support is, is dribbling away, but he's a lot more popular than the Congress. By the end of that figure, he looks, the gap is at least as big as Bill Clinton had. So there's something about being in Congress that it's just a lot harder to command the respect of the public. Here's a ton of data on, the congr on congressional approval going way back. And I drew some straight lines and put labels on here to remind you when this was a Democratic Congress, when it was a Republican one, and then it became a Democratic one again. And red is approval and blue is disapproval. So this is a picture of a pretty unpopular Congress in the beginning of this period. And the Democrats have controlled it as long as anybody remembers. People write books that say Congress, the permanent Democratic majority. Those books come out just about 93. They're very badly timed. It turns out to be wrong. Um, but everybody thought the Democrats were going to control the Congress as long as the eye could see. And then they kind of hit a level of such low approval, lower than 30%, 60% disapproval. People were ready for a change. The Republicans take control. Slowly, approval rises. It wasn't overnight. Once Newt Gingrich was Speaker, the approval for Congress didn't jump 30 points. But the part of the achievement of the Republicans holding the Congress for 12 years was they, they built up the approval. People liked the job they were doing by the uh, round 98, after the 98 election before 2000, as George Bush gets elected president. Congress's approval is close to 50 percent, a little bit higher in, in around 2001, but that, that disappeared fast. And then it starts to fall again. It looks like a sine wave or something natural, up, down, up, down. So then the Democrats take over. And again, they don't, they don't get a huge surge in approval. After the 2006 elections, Democrats control the House and the Senate. Congressional approval is still pretty bad. It looks pretty, pretty low. It looks bad even compared with a fairly unpopular president. At the end of this figure, approval is just ticking up slightly. And there have been a couple of stories lately saying congressional approval in polls are as high as we've seen in a long time. It's still pretty, pretty low, actually, if you judge it by uh, comparison to, say, 2000, 2001, 2002. But maybe this is kind of a natural cycle. The congressional numbers are going to get better and better. Um, very hard to say. I think we wrap up with some sort of uh, some summary of what we know about congressional approval and a few tepid predictions. Uh, congressional approval is a lot harder to understand. It's clearly hard to love a legislature, much harder than it is to like an individual. The partisans are not as loyal. Partisans stand by their president. Republicans say, I'm with Bush. Even at the end of the presidency, Republicans were giving a pretty good report, support. People don't mind saying, this Congress controlled by my party is doing a crappy job. I don't like them. Um, disapproval doesn't ensure defeat. If you look at, the, um, look at this initial period, Democrats controlling the Congress had very low job approval, kept control for quite a long time. Republicans didn't lose it when their approval fell. It takes a while. There's a big incumbency advantage built into the US Congress. And the Congress can be a great scapegoat for a president. So should I make some predictions? Well, here are three quotes about the folly of making predictions when you're an academic or any other forecaster. If you live by the crystal ball, you learn to eat the round glass. On the other hand, if you have to forecast, forecast often, because at least one of them will be right. And you can just highlight that one later and try to pretend you didn't say the other things. And the herd instinct amongst forecasters makes sheep look like independent thinkers. So there's a sheep there trying to figure out what stocks to buy and sell um, online. What do I think is likely to happen? Uh, I think the approval of the presidential dog, I don't know if this is a blue dog Democrat or black dog Democrat, it's going to be high. People like very cute Portuguese water dogs. The Obama honeymoon will continue. He'll probably have three more months of pretty, pretty high approval, even as the press gets worse. But it'll get worse eventually. His approval will fall. Uh, people who are saying they don't know will say they don't like him. Some of the people who are saying they approve will start to disapprove. The more decisions he makes, the more people are, there are going to be people out there who think, I'm just not happy with what he's done on X. I like the other things, but I can't tell a pollster I like the job he's doing, given what he just did on, you name it, Iraq, abortion, the economy, spending. There will be something that annoys people. Despite the ex exceptionally friendly press, he, I don't think he'll be a Teflon president who just who's never sees low approval. But Congress will be worse. Congress will take more of the brunt. Uh, that's a, if you want one safe prediction, someone bets you that the Congress is going to have higher approval than the president, take that bet. Every time. 
So let me uh, let you give you a chance to ask some questions. Any questions you like? I'll turn things back to our moderator. Okay, we have like uh, ten minutes for questions, I think. So anybody, I'll recognize them right here, and we'll start. Hi. Hi. Um, what did you have you heard of a uh, five thirty eight dot com, and what do you think of a uh, Nate Silver's site? Oh, uh, no, the guy who made it. What, what do oh. you think of what? It, and uh, so this. One of the, it used to be that only political scientists had this, uh, this quantity of polling data at their fingertips. You had to uh, hunt around and, and hire research assistants and waste all your time looking at different polling sites to get it. And now there's a bunch of places online. Pollster.com is one, 538.com is another, that do the polling. They grab all the polls for you. If you want to see quickly without trusting any one pollster, go to 538, go to pollster.com. The pollingreport.com is another such site. There's a lot of them. I think it's a great service. 538 was founded by someone who says cut his teeth on baseball statistics. Um, baseball happens to be a very numeric sport. It's the only sport that has sort of created its own branch of statistics, and I think they're pretty good at crunching numbers. So, uh, you know, they'll, they'll each, these places all have a little bit of, a, of kind of tone in their commentary. They have their own biases, but if you just want to know what's in the polls, what can I figure out? They're, these are excellent sites, and I you know, encourage you to go look at them. Okay. Over here. How does the world see Barack Obama? How does, how does the world look at his presidency? Does he look at like in the right way? Uh, where does Russia stand? Say? Where does North Korea stand? And uh, the, the rest of the, uh, of the world sees Barack Obama? I, well, I would agree with what uh, Professor Wayne said earlier, that he's much more popular than George Bush in most of the world. I think probably not literally all of it. Uh, during the, the campaign, uh, so back to the uh, about October or so, a few pollsters sort of went around the world and asked people who they would vote for if they were Americans. And Obama won almost all countries. I think he didn't win India. I don't think he won Israel. But uh, almost every other country I can think of, he would have beaten McCain. He would have beaten Bush had Bush been running for re-election. He clearly is, is, has been quite popular. However, I think the same dynamic will take place. And I'll take the European trip as my example. Uh, he gets some praise for having uh, gone to Turkey and said he wants Turkey to be in the EU. But uh, he wants Turkey to be in the European Union. He annoyed lots of people in the European Union with that, that, with that position, so particularly the French. It's much easier to say, uh, to criticize the, the previous incumbent, George Bush, and say he's mishandling his f foreign affairs. He's much too unilateral. Once you're president, you've got to start making unilateral decisions. He didn't really get anything out of the Europeans tangible on getting NATO troops in Afghanistan. I think he's going to find that just talking to the Europeans and showing he understands them and he respects them doesn't get him nearly as far as he likes. And he's, as he starts to take positions like Turkey should be in the EU, he'll make as many enemies as he makes friends. So I don't think it's an easy job to be American president. I'm, uh, I, I, no matter who has it, you, you, you build up coalitions of enemies pretty fast. I think Obama uh, will enjoy uh, popularity worldwide, but he's, he's going to discover that lots of people are unhappy with individual decisions everywhere. Okay, any other questions? OK, Becky. On just kind of piggybacking off that last question, um, do you think it's, uh, you're familiar with Fareed Zakaria's book and his recent declarations about all that stuff. Uh, do you think his opinions on what's happening with like you know everybody else coming up? Do you think that's another thing working against Barack Obama? Um, I, I you know I think fundamentally the difficult difficulty Barack Obama has is being president of the United States. He's president of the world's only superpower. Um, he's gonna he's he, I, you know I. I'll say, this sounds like a defense of George Bush. I think lots of the things that George Bush, Bush did that made him enemies worldwide, any American president was going to find he was going to lose support worldwide. So I guess in that respect, I think there are some structural problems with being leader of the United States now. No matter who the individual is, it's going to be difficult to be universally admired. It's going to be hard to be admired across Europe. Um, and certainly, it's going to be hard to be admired across the Muslim world. No matter how deft Obama is about diplomacy, I think there's some very big divergences in policy. Uh, what he does with Iran is, is not, he's going to make somebody un very unhappy no matter what he does as we try to re react to the development of a nuclear program in Iran. So, you know, I guess I agree if, if, the, if we take the premise of the uh, book to be that the, being leader of the United States right now means being unpopular. I think that's, there's some truth in that. Okay, any other questions? Last call. Okay, so let's thank Dr. James. Yeah.